We've all gone through this. You're sitting down in school, at a desk, the room hums in silence. So quietly that you can feel the glaring pulse of the fluorescence overhead. It's test day, and the teacher paces impatiently, reading the daily, peering over the hems, to ensure that everyone is keeping their eyes in check. Your fellow students are all scratching away at their papers, some with confidence and others in fear, but all with a sense of urgency. You can't help but take a look around, letting it all set in, the confusion of knowing you studied hard yet not understanding certain questions. The way the clock seems to move so fast in such a still environment, and the excitement or fear of not being in control. You check your work twice, never really satisfied, holding on to the hope that you've done your best. Tokyo is the city that you study for before leaving and realize upon arrival that you couldn't have possibly prepared for what is to come. A living, breathing organism that as an outsider, you will never truly comprehend. So sit back and just enjoy the show. Subtitles are not provided. You probably have no idea where I am right now, do you? Well, I'm in Tokyo. Welcome to one of my favorite cities in the world. It is just a huge assembly of just every little boy and little girl's dream. It's absolutely crazy, but it can be absolutely serene. And that's why we wanted to start here today to show you that there are so many different sides and faces to Tokyo. And at the end of the day, it comes down to what you want to experience and how you want to see the city. I love seeing a balance of these kind of beautiful, natural landmarks. And at the same time, mix that in with the cacophony of just crazy restaurants and bars and quirky people. Over the next few days, I'm going to show you how confused I get each time I come to the city. I've been here close to seven times and I still find myself being absolutely lost in the different kind of districts. There's something for everyone here. I'm just going to show you the way I like to do it. The first thing you need to know if you're planning to spend a couple of days in Tokyo is that there are two main airports, Haneda and Narita. You could be tempted to land in Haneda since it's closer. However, the facilities are smaller and getting through immigration here can sometimes be lengthy. Its express train will only take you straight to Shinagawa where you'll need to take another train to reach your destination. Narita, although further, is usually more seamless and has an efficient express train running to the center of the city. If I could choose, I would go for Haneda, but only if the plane lands in the morning or late at night. For both airports, the trains are much cheaper, but aren't necessarily shorter than a taxi ride, depending on the traffic. Close to 40 million people call Greater Tokyo home. Let that sink in. All of Australia doesn't even have that many inhabitants. Population aside, it is almost three times larger than New York City. No wonder you will never truly be able to explore it all, even if you live here. Even then, it seems like a gigantic task. When a city is this big, as a tourist, we should focus on where most of the businesses, cultural institutions, restaurants, and activities reside. There are over 20 district wards, and to make it more confusing, these are further divided into districts and neighborhoods. Depending on what your interests are, I doubt that you'll feel the need to visit all of them, which makes your choice of accommodation so key. The way I break it down, if you're looking to shop and stay in a higher-end area, choose Ginza or Omotesando. If history is your thing, position yourself around the Tokyo station. Go towards Asakusa and Ueno if you're looking for traditional accommodation and experiences. If you don't have much time to spend, search for places around Akasaka or Shinjuku, or around the younger districts Shibuya, Harajuku, or Aoyama. On the other hand, if you're going to be staying in the city longer and want to feel like a local, I recommend Ibisu, the Yoyogi neighborhood, or Meguro. What a stressful first day. Our flight was delayed one hour and then our car ride took about 40 minutes more than it should have. So we were about 15 minutes late for a sushi reservation, which is something that should never happen. And I will tell you all about that experience soon. But we are just now settling in to the apartment. We were supposed to be here at 1 p.m. It is now 10 p.m. So we're literally nine hours behind schedule and I am just so tired, man. Oh. Who am I kidding? Let's go out.
You can imagine that getting around a city this big sounds like a nightmare. Taxis can be quite expensive. They usually start around $6 and climb more or less by dollar every kilometer. To give you a sense of scale, the 19 kilometers between Haneda and Shibuya will on average cost you around $80. I usually use them only when the train lines close from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Your second option is to walk. The city is very clean and extremely comfortable to walk through, but when the distances between wards can take ages to cover, you're left with your third option, the Tokyo subway. If you've traveled around big cities, the metro can be quite a peculiar place. From street artists to graffiti, wafting unwelcome smells, buskers, pushing, shoving, and everything in between. I've had both great and questionable experiences in subways. The one in Tokyo should be a shining example for everyone else. Trains are on time, signs are clearly posted, both Japanese and English come through the PA system, the bathrooms are clean, the food options can be amazing. I've never seen anyone try to get in without a ticket, and the station map covers the whole city. You are never more than a 15 minute walk away from the train station. However, when you look at this map, it can seem quite confusing. When you're deep in the Tokyo Metro subway, I know it might sound confusing, but let me break it down for you. The Tokyo Metro services 179 stations on nine lines. You can use them all at your own convenience and depending on your itinerary, but the most useful one is the Tokyo Metro. The Tokyo Metro has probably the largest network of lines. The subway is so key and so important to getting around. It's just much easier than going on the street, and most of the time it's easier to kind of locate yourself depending on the metro stations that you kind of come down on. They have a 24-hour ticket that you can get, so I used to be that person that used to go to the counter and just buy like single journey tickets, but those things rack up and become quite expensive. So here, just bring your passport to the counter, people here speak English, grab a whole day 24-hour ticket, and you can use both systems that are available to you. Hi, miss. So you have three choices that are actually pretty cool. You can do a 24-hour ticket for 800 yen, you can do a 48-hour ticket for 1,200 yen, and 72-hour ticket, which is very cool, which is a perfect weekend, basically, for 1,500 yen. So it does get cheaper as you go along. The most important thing to do when you're buying, especially singular tickets or just when you're going around is just knowing exactly where you're going. You have these information boards that are absolutely great and just help you kind of navigate the metro lines because it isn't actually that complicated. It's just once you understand your destination, the station you're stopping in and the direction you're going in, it's much easier. Right now we're in Omote Sando. I want to get to Tokyo Station, which is one of the main stations up here. And I can say, all right, I want to end here. And I press search and it'll tell me exactly what lines I need to take, it will tell me exactly what switches I need to take, and it will also tell me whether or not the stations have free Wi-Fi or not, which I think is absolutely amazing because there is free Wi-Fi absolutely everywhere here. The best value for your money is the Tokyo Subway 24-hour ticket. You can get these at tourist information desks located in Shinjuku, Ginza, Omotesando, and Ueno stations from 9.15 to 5.15 p.m. Once you're all set up and ready to go, make sure to have a look at the Tokyo Metro Guide free brochure to get a good lay of the land and find out what station is next to which attraction or destination. If you have a hard time remembering the name of the stations, just look at the letter number code next to them. It'll help you locate yourself much faster. Just like the railroad, during the day, things are on track. People move almost mechanically with astounding efficiency. Japanese are known to be amicable, polite, and respectful. Omotenashi, or selfless hospitality, is the backbone of Japanese culture. To an outsider's eye, it seems that everything has a code and a ceremony to it. An outspoken ritual for everyday life. However, they're also known to push the boundaries of technology, fashion, and entertainment. We've all seen the quirky game shows, the comic books, and the themed cafes. I've always wondered where this balance is struck. From two-handed business card exchanges or distinguishing stature through levels of bows, to SNM bars where hot wax is dripped on you while you drink and disheveled businessmen happily stagger on side streets, attempting to make the last strain of the night. The setting sun brings with it a flip side of the local culture, one that is still set in humility, but that also knows how to have a good time.
After our amazing sushi experience, I want to make sure that you guys probably don't feel as uncomfortable as we do or make the mistakes we did. We came in there, first of all, 15 minutes late. You should be arriving 15 minutes early. When you get there, just be very kind to everyone, sit down. But what we did is we just started putting all our stuff on the table. I don't think people reacted really well to it. The lady who was serving us kept coming up to and saying, you know, thank you for taking nice pictures, but could you please eat the food first? The reason why we don't have much footage of Sushi Shin is because we were basically told not to shoot out of respect, which I completely understand. But I was happy we went through the experience. I always loved going to Sushi Yas and I wanted to kind of show you what it felt like. And obviously I can't, so the best thing to do for you is one day if you come to Tokyo, please do try one of these Sushi Yas. And in front of me, I have, well, first of all, I've been kind of like downing this sake. It's absolutely beautiful. It's really smooth, it's like a good wine, and when it's well selected, it's even better. And here, at least you know you're in the right hands, and people can kind of recommend what you should drink, but they have amazing food. And here we have some boiled spinach, and this is with crab flakes, and some crab fat. It tastes like cream, it tastes like butter, it tastes like heaven, it tastes like love, it tastes like sex, it tastes like something I just want to keep eating, it's so good. Next here we have kind of like a quail egg, on some sort of tartare. I'm pretty sure it's fish. It has a fishy taste, but it has a texture of like fruit. It's almost like a very clean tuna with like a soy brine, some green onions, a raw quail like that just really kind of ties into the creaminess together. And finally, the one I'm most excited about, it's raw scallops with what was written as a tofu cream. Okay, now that's really weird. It's like scallops with a tofu cream for sure, but this time it does have a nectarine, nectarine pieces in it. So it's almost like a Greek yogurt with fruit, but then there's some raw scallop in there, which sounds completely off, but it just makes sense. And a recurring theme you'll see in Tokyo, sometimes the weirdest things at the end of the day here make sense. Ganpai. There are quite a few sushi counters in the city, and these can be divided into four types in my eyes. The omakase sushi I experience, the standing counters, the conveyor belts, and the casual sushi restaurants. The current highly recommended omakase counters are Saito, Sugita, Mitani, Hashigushi, Hatsinuzushi, Sukiyabashi Jiro, Amamoto, Arai, Shin, Sho, Shosaito, and Ishikawa. The list could go on. Each chef has his own subtle takes on sushi, proving that food is truly an art. Make sure to figure out how to book these even before you book your flight dates. If you don't want to be paying upwards of 200 US dollars a meal for dinner, see if they're open for lunch. Usually their menu prices drop down dramatically. For more laid back experiences, check out Hanamaru, Sushi no Midori, Toriton, Mikore, Zanmai, and the places around the Tsukiji market in the morning. Traveling is about identifying your comfort zone and ripping it off completely. So don't be afraid to just wander around with no other purpose but to walk and discover. Finding situations that you need to experience first before understanding them. You'll find these really cool alleys. This one's called Nanbei Alley right next to Shibuya. Uh, you got the Golden Guy right next to Shinjuku. A lot of different yoko chos where you can find different food. But these are more focused on drinking and you walk down and you have these tiny little bars that sit like maybe four to six people. It's just such a very kind of warm atmosphere because you're literally in this tiny 15 square meter space with the bartender and it's a very kind of intimate conversation you're having. Don't be afraid of just jumping into one of them. Usually people are very nice. They'll look at you. If you don't look welcome, they'll give you a stare, but most of the time you can just kind of rock up, grab a stool, have a good drink, and. Better yet, have a great conversation. Some of my favorite alleys, food streets, or yokochos as they call them locally are Ebisu, Golden Guy, Nanbei Alley, Shinjuku West, Harmonica, and Amiyoko. Once you've had your fill of solids, it's about time we had a drink. The dive bar scene in Japan can be absolutely crazy and in Tokyo even more so. So it's really about just kind of finding what you like. Sometimes it has a lot to do with just luck and falling on something you think is pretty cool and going in and being surprised by it. So we're in front of Beat Cafe right now after walking around Shibuya quite a bit. And there's a bunch of new places that are opening up all the time. There's a really cool craft brewery place that we passed through. And now Beat Cafe is known for just indie music, good rock music, and that's kind of what I felt like today. 
there's so much great Japanese whiskey out there and I know a lot of people are aficionados when it comes to whiskeys nowadays. Usually bartenders will have you taste things, try things, so you can bring home some bottles and share with your friends, but if you're in a bar, just rock up, whiskey soda in hand, you should have a good time. Some cocktail bars I've enjoyed going to in the past are Bar Rage, Tafia, Bar Trench, Ben Fittich, Star Bar, High Five, Jen Yamamoto for cocktail omakase experience, and Auden for great whiskey. For craft beers, check out Craftsman, Good Beer Faucets, Harajuku Taproom, and Mikuler. For sake, go to Sasagin, Nihonchi Sanmoto, Shushu, and Kuran Sake Market for some DIY pours. And for a more eclectic feel and to charge until the wee hours of the night, Jump into Brooklyn Parlor, Grandfather's, Oath Club, Shelter, Koara, Bridge DJ Bar, Nightingale, or Grassroots. We started off with some highballs at the very friendly and easygoing Beat Cafe, before finding our way to one of the smallest bars, Bonobo, with a back door that leads you into a tiny two-floor nightclub to listen to one of the best DJ sets I've ever heard in my life. I like to think that dancing does burn calories and that alcohol just goes through you so quickly. And to make sure that you can still hit all the sights in the early morning, it might be good to have a late night meal to soak it all up. Well, you're in luck. There are a bunch of restaurants that stay open until late. Ichiran Ramen, Sushi Zan Mai Higashi, Kakemoki Gyoza, Kameya, and Isomari Suisan all operate for 24 hours. If that's too intense for you, and if you're looking for food around the midnight mark, yet don't really know what you want to eat, enter the beautiful izakaya. I was getting a little sad because we were walking around and we got rejected by a bar, we got rejected by izakaya, some of them were closing, some of them were full. And it just comes to show that when you're in Tokyo and you're a group larger than one or two or three people, you just have to be very kind of conscious of the decisions you make in terms of the restaurants and the bars, and if you reserve them or not, and if you're willing to go out of your way to go to a certain place and then eventually not be able to go in. But, you know, we made up for it here. We're this really cool, loud izakaya and I couldn't be happier. The food's been fantastic. And it's a really loud ambience, but with good food. And that's what we were after. So it just goes to show that sometimes in Tokyo, you know, or in traveling in general, you know, you can plan everything you want, but at the end of the day, the experiences get even more fun when you stumble upon hidden gems. Some of my favorite ones include Kaikaian by the Sea, Nishio-san, Uoshin, Romambu, Andy Shin, Hinomoto, and Jomon. Balance and subtlety are values you don't often come across in large cities. It seems to be an art that the Japanese are continuously improving on. You could be staring at steel mountains on the curb of the street just to turn the corner and fall onto natural spectacles. This is the Shinjuku Garden. It's like a green lung in the middle of the city. In between some of the most bustling areas of Tokyo, you got Shinjuku on one side, you got Shibuya on the other side. And it's just such a serene, peaceful place. I don't know if you can hear it, but when I stop talking, it's just silence. And you've got these beautiful bonsai trees. You've got a Japanese garden, you've got a Western garden. And it's one of those places, if you have the extra time and you want to get away from the hustle bustle of the city, it makes a lot of sense to just come here walk through it, it'll maybe take you 10 to 20 minutes just to pass it from point to point, and it'll just make you feel more relaxed again. I always feel it's very important to have that balance when you're traveling, especially for such a short period of time. It can get very intense, so it's important to come to places like this just to kind of like restore your energy and, you know, relax a little bit. If you're looking to be more in tune with nature, just two kilometers away, you will find yourself at the Meiji Shrine. Look how crazy beautiful this place is. This is the Meiji Shrine, probably one of my favorite green places and spaces in Tokyo. And it's just supercharged with spiritualism, right smack in the center in between Shinjuku and Harajuku and Shibuya. And it's a place where you literally feel like you're in the middle of this massive forest. I believe it's about 136 acres, so it's huge. I believe it was one of the last shrines commissioned by an emperor in the 19th century. And it's a place you want to come if you just want to calm down a little bit. But at the same time, you have Yoyogi Park, which is right next to it. And Yoyogi Park can get quite crazy with its rockabilly rockers, with drunk people sometimes on the gardens, with Harajuku girls dressing up. It's a very colorful place. So you do this very spiritual, quiet thing, and then you go to Yoyogi Park after. Other shrines or temples that are worth a visit are the Sensoji Temple, Sengakuji, or Asakusa. 
Once you've rejuvenated yourself with organic energy, it's time to discover Tokyo's booming specialty coffee scene. Just like anything food and beverage related here, there seems to be an attachment to not necessarily being the best, but to exist in an ecosystem where everyone is trying to be the best version of themselves. This is prevalent in restaurants, bars, and now also in coffee shops. Get your fix at Onibus, The Roaster by Nosy Coffee, Arise, Fulgen, Little Nap Coffee Stand, or About Life. Right next to the famous Blue Bottle Coffee, you will also find Commune Second, the third iteration of an open air food and drink park, a stop for those who aren't sure what they want to eat yet. Let's take a break from focusing on our stomachs and discover what else Tokyo has to offer. As you can imagine, people here have a deep respect and attachment to their history. This is put on display in the many museums in the different wards, such as the Tokyo National Museum, the Edo Tokyo Museum to understand the city's past. And if art is more interesting to you, you have the National Museum of Modern Art, Mori Art, and the Metropolitan Art Museum. If you're traveling with kids, the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation could be interesting or for a walk into the past in an easy to miss spot in the city, the Shitamachi Museum. So we're about to hit the Shitamachi Museum and if this were a different time of the year, you'd have slightly more colors, but it's still really pretty. I've always been a fan of history museums because they have a very quirky way to kind of spur up your imagination and make you feel like you're in a different place. And here we're in the Shitamachi Museum, which is a museum that basically covers how life used to be in Japan. I'll just show you how people used to live around here. And it's very quaint, it's very fun. You know, like Japan in terms of art has always been at the forefront of a lot of different things and a lot of different categories. And what I love about Tokyo is you can see everything from these styles of natural history or history museum and then more modern galleries and things around the city as well. One of the other most beautiful museums I've seen, amazing architectural lines drawn by Kengo Kuma, nestled among Japanese gardens in the heart of Amatasando. In it, one of the largest collections of pre-modern Japanese and East Asian art. Looking for some other fun stuff? Well, there is always the toilet museum or a place where you can be a samurai for a day. The options when it comes to shopping in Tokyo are absolutely endless. You can go from anything from high-end shopping malls like Kite right here behind me beside the Tokyo main station, or you could go to little nodes like we're heading now to Harajuku, to Shibuya, and find a lot of different boutiques. Omote Sando has some really kind of higher end but more artsy stuff as well. Um, so the variety is massive. Just kind of research the areas so that you don't spend too much time traveling between each of them. Certain areas cater to specific needs and can help you decide where you want to spend most of your yen. Omote Sando and Ginza are great for higher-end stores, large luxury department stores, or expensive boutiques. Harajuku and Shibuya mix in luxury with shops that cater to a younger, more experimental crowd. Shinjuku and Meguro are great places for department stores as well as a huge selection of second-hand shops, from specialty camera lenses to intact luxury watches. Head on to Akihabara for all your electronic needs and otaku-related items. You can also go to places like up-and-coming Shimokitazawa for trendy yet low-key finds. I personally love going around the Harajuku area for some original finds and thrift shops. Secondhand culture in Tokyo is pretty huge. You have these amazing secondhand camera shops, you have amazing secondhand watch shops, and you have amazing secondhand clothing shops like Kimji, for example. But then in each category, you have a very huge difference between what's really expensive and the really, really cheap ones. So try to find a balance between both and the ones you want to check out. For example, Kimji is quite on the lower end of the price scale, but really cool secondhand clothes. And you have something like Ragtag, which is much pricier, much more brand focused and oriented. So what I love is that you really have that spectrum of choice and of prices when it comes to secondhand buys. 
We can make a whole episode about like the quirky little stores that we can find like absolutely everything from toothbrushes to magnets to shoes. I love these mixed use stores and today we're in front of the awesome store. Let's see if it's really awesome. Was the awesome store awesome? Yep. It was pretty awesome. Like, it's all the stuff that you know you're never gonna use ever, but it's gonna look good in your shelves and you just wanna afford it. While you're in the area, drop by the inexpensive Harajuku Gyoza for a bite. We saw this little place called Harajuku Gyoza, which apparently is taken off and people are all over it. So we got these beautifully kind of pan-fried steamed gyozas with garlic. So you have the choice of with garlic or without garlic. The garlicky flavor really comes out and comes through. It's not too pungent. It's really tasty. I could definitely go through like 12 of these in, in a heartbeat. And it's not too expensive. It's about 600 yen for about 12 pieces. Pretty decent. After your first day in the city, you will really feel like you are bouncing from one area to the other because there's just so much to do and you'll feel the need to do it all as quickly as possible. What I try to do is concentrate on two or three neighboring wards in one day and just attack the city in sections. You will also wanna keep your travel time to a minimum. So for a seamless trip, use the Tokyo Subway Navigation app to check your itinerary and get directions to your next destination. All you have to do is type in your departure station and your destination station. Then the app will tell you exactly how to get there. Best part is, you can use it offline. Talking about train stations, some of the best restaurants can be found in them or in an underground location. From the now uber famous Jiro Sushi to one of the best yakitori places, Birdland. Or even just for a delicious piece of crispy, deep fried, surprisingly never oily cut of pork. Right now we're about to have some katsu and I'm so excited, the smell is intoxicating. It's almost like a perfume that you do not want to wear just because you know people are going to look at you weirdly, but when it comes out of a restaurant, it smells heavenly and right now it just smells like deep fried food. And I know it's going to be crispy and delicious and it's full. We've been in line just for maybe 10 minutes, it's pretty quick and we're about to get in right now. We're about to eat our katsu meal. The perfect start for me is always this fluffy, beautiful, sweet white rice. Amazing. Some of the shrimp now. This is a yuzu. There's a bit of that on there. I love Japanese katsu, especially made in Japan. Not oily. Perfect balance. Not massive portions. But the pork and shrimp one, you're gonna try both. I'll try the one with the egg, and you'll have a really good time. This obsession for food translates into so many retail business opportunities, including places where you can buy treats from other regions in Japan. So if you only have about four to five days, you might wanna just spend them in Tokyo and the areas around Tokyo, but Japan has so much to offer. And if you're tight for time, what's cool about these shops that are spread along Yurakucho and Ginza, you have these shops that specialize in food and products from a certain region. So for example, here we're standing in front of Hokkaido do Sanko Plaza, which has all like the really nice ice creams, whether it is soy sauce, or maybe it's especially uh, ponzu or tofu or pickles that come from Hokkaido can be found in there. So if you wanna bring home some products for some friends or you wanna try something different, we'll put up the list for you. Best thing about Hokkaido is the Hokkaido milk. So if you do come here, or if you come to any Hokkaido kind of place like this, melon and vanilla ice cream, look at that. Made from heaven, actually delicious. The best thing about Japan is that not only do they try to be the best at Japanese food, but they also apply that same intensity and fascination of learning to other cultures as well from beers to whiskey to French pastries. I look like an absolute glutton right now. There's always been a fascination, I think, from the Japanese looking towards the French when it comes to food, with everything. And I think now you're seeing the French looking to the Japanese in terms of inspiration as well. So you really have that push and pull of those two cultures coming together. Dominic Anzal is one of those that it's extremely trendy, but when you're here in Tokyo and you don't have it in like New York, for example, I highly recommend you try it. I have the corn soft serve. 
That's so good. I'm like not much for sweets, but that's delicious. It overwhelms me to eat so much sweets, so I'm gonna switch places with my director. Because <laughs> a lot of people watch this and they think, you know, I'm doing this on purpose and I really don't like the food, but I actually really do like it, but someone who's gonna appreciate it much more than I am. This is Sari. Hello. You got some food. <laughs> oh my God. I know I have some food on my face. It does not matter because even my face is hungry for the shit. Take a bite of the kiwi. The kiwi. Bro, Dominic has some paper. Oh my God, how do I eat this? I don't know. It's tough, man. It has chocolate seeds. Oh, are those seeds? I didn't take a bite out of it. Chocolate seeds. Okay, I'm gonna try to go for the seeds. How was that? I like this one a lot. It's, it's dripping all over your face, bro. One of the other famous French chefs that came to Tokyo and set up as well is Joël Robuchon. He recently just opened Pain de Joël Robuchon, which is basically like a bakery slash patisserie. And now you have French people being inspired by Japanese people. This is curry bread. It's like pumpkin, spiced beef, curry, kaffir lime leaves. That's some good stuff. Next, we have their famous Croque Monsieur, French sandwich, which is basically bread and cheese. But this one uses a nice mix of Japanese mushrooms right on top. And you've got a nice little piece of ham in there. Look how gorgeous that looks. Creamy, so much butter. Definitely not Japanese food, but delicious nonetheless. And I do want to say a couple things about that. Japanese people tend to assimilate culture in a way that they try to improvise, yet improve, yet localize certain flavors, which I think is really cool because when you eat French food here in Japan, it's not necessarily classical French food because it's always influenced slightly here. So I always tell people when you come to Tokyo, just don't limit yourself to just the Japanese restaurants. Yes, there's a lot, but also do take note of the other types of restaurants that you have here because you do know that if they're successful here, that means they're at a certain caliber. The same thing can be said about sandwiches. Bread isn't a traditional ingredient in these parts and had to come from somewhere. The katsu sando was born out of European influence and Japanese interest in the 19th century, creating the perfect fried cutlet sandwich. I mean, I would totally have invented that if I had the chance. However, some people take it a step further. If you're going to deep fry something, might as well make it a fatty, prized slice of wagyu in between two pieces of fluffy white bread. Crust soft, please. So we're at the Wagyu Mafia cutlet shop. If you go around Tokyo a lot, you'll see a bunch of different steak sandwiches, uh, usually different sandos. It's very common to have pork katsu sandos. This is a steak katsu sandu. So basically, Nagano Prefecture Wagyu beef. You saw it a while ago, just lots of fat in there, covered and then deep fried and then put into some white bread. And that's just super clean. You taste the beef. You taste the white bread. I love that the bread has no crust. It's perfectly toasted, but none of the flavors are overpowering. You really just taste what's inside, and I think that's what's important. On a good day, I'd finish this really easily. They actually have one at 20,000 yen, and I was really tempted to get it. It was a Kobe Shabu uh, beef sandwich, but I said, all right, no, I'm gonna go for the one that's at 5,000, so in the mid-range, and it's delicious. But I know we have a long night ahead of us and a lot more eating to do. Even one of the most famous dishes coming out of Japan was born in a different country altogether. The ramen craze seems like it's been going on for a while all over the world, but it's been going on even longer in Japan. Apparently influenced by the Chinese lamian, this is one of the few dishes that has no strict rules to it. So Japanese ramen chefs have become rock stars, creating various inflections from yuzu to crab fat broths hand or machine kneading noodles with different levels of bounce and topping these steaming bowls with anything from shashu, a perfectly cooked piece of pork belly, to deftly mastered custard-like egg yolks. We went to Furi, one of the rising ramen chains, and Sari was so excited that she forgot to turn on the microphone. To talk over myself, what we had was arguably one of the best bowls of yuzu ramen with extra grilled pork. Line up outside, place a couple of coins in the ticket machine, and get ready to be served within five minutes. Slurp loudly and fervently. It's expected. Other places you can get your noodle cravings curbed are Suzuran Ramen, Chicken and Clam Broth Ramen at Mugu Toribu, Lamb Bone Ramen at Mencho Tokyo, Roast Beef Ramen at Yukochu Ramen Matador, Truffle Ramen at Suta, Tsukumen at Fuunji, and Kanda Matsuya for soba or Maruka for Kagawa style udon. 
talking about food, no trip is complete without going to the Tsukiji Market. So this is the Tsukiji Market. Obviously, it is one of the biggest draws in Tokyo, Japan. We see some of the best sushi chefs in town come in here to buy their fish. And it's just something that I really do recommend people do. So really just have that one day where you wake up really early to do it. After that whole experience, you have two great sushi restaurants that everyone goes to that's in the outer market side. You have these massive shirashi bowls, you have a sushi tasting, lots of different varieties and options. And I think that what the best thing is, is Literally, the fish comes from here, and the fish from all over Japan and seafood from all over Japan gets consolidated here. So you know that the quality you're getting is absolutely top notch. The outer market is an easier experience, not as intimidating. It's easy to get around there. And then finally, where we're going today, there's a new building called Tsukiji Oagashi, I believe. And it's a new three floor building that was initially created for everyone to be able to move there eventually. It's a little more, let's say, sanitized and clinical than the outer market, but it's a great food experience as well. As I did mention, it is a holiday currently this weekend, and this is the Tsukiji outer bustling market. Everything is closed. 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 Hello? Anyone there? I just want, I just, I just want seafood. That's all I want. Usually, this whole space would have lots of activities. You can buy some knives. Just, just imagine it. Hopefully, the Uwagashi is open. That's a newer building, right? No. So that's closed too. You need to figure something out. But if you're here on a non-holiday, then obviously this would be a really great place to come. So now the plan is we try to find something open and hopefully have some really fresh seafood too. So when there's a will, there's a way. There's people walking around, so there are things open. Let's see, see what we find. All right, first stop, we're gonna get some uni. Torch looks delicious. Ooh, someone's cutting in line. <laughs> we have it in camera, someone's cutting me in line. All right, let's go. Like I can smell some citrus in there already. There's some wasabi. Everything's torched beautifully. Look at that color. It's so lush, creamy. It almost feels decadent. Should I share some with you guys? I don't know. Do you deserve it? But we have uni and ikura, two of my favorite things in an inari uh, sushi style, which is basically the tofu skin. It's just perfect. Now I'm gonna go for the uni. Oops, it's getting messy. Why? Why do you do this to me? I'm so happy. I don't care if everything's closed, we're still having a good time. It's still really delicious. So for everyone that's wondering why we're doing this, because everyone always wonders where my leftovers go. So we decided to just show you how we really do shoot. So after Erwan eats it, the bowls come to us, camera peeps, you know, I'm the director, and this is what the host serves me up. What do you gotta do? You're in Japan, you don't wanna let this nice uni to waste, you eat all of it. <laughs> I love myself a good tamago. It's like little fluffy presents from heaven. It's just so light. It's cheating. Because it's just so good. Thank Grilled tuna. I want to find something that's not good. We need drama in this show. All right, we're looking at trifecta. We're gonna start with this plump oyster. Usually when you get these fat oysters that are very creamy, it kind of puts you off. That was nice and clean, nice and skinny. Time for the crab. I'm gonna use my hands. Doesn't get more beautiful than that. Look at that, my friends. I give up, I give up, I give up. Scallops and uni. Mm -mm. Gotta do it. You gotta switch. Just kill me, guys. Go for the best thing I've ever had. Earlier, Erwan had an oyster. And then I gave him this face. Because he said we didn't have any for me. And so he's so nice. He bought me one. Yes or no? Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. Thanks, Erwan. Now I know you love me for sure.
Raw scallops, probably one of my favorite things with some freshly grated wasabi. Just sweet, sweet temptation. You know the type of stuff you eat and it just has a soundtrack in your head? This is like, I've been feeling fine, baby. Trying to hold back this feeling for so long. It's not a song. <laughs> so now we're back down to the sticks. Unagi. Filthy, smooth. It's such a fatty tasting fish. It's almost like a pork of the sea. You got some swordfish. Even though it's like sitting there, it's already pre-cooked, they're just heating it up. It stays quite moist. Tuna, yellowfin. So I haven't found something I don't like. Tokyo, you're making it hard for me. Salmon. I've run out of words, man. You Nagi's the winner. So good. You need dessert after all that glorious seafood that we just had. Every region in Japan will have different flavors of different things. You have a lot of places with different uh, flavors of soft serve. But first, let's try this. So this is a vanilla and matcha swirl. What I love about soft serve here is never really kind of heavy, even though it's rich and decadent it always tends to fluff up and be very light. After trying this, I feel like we should do a whole segment about just ice cream you can find in a convenience store. So we're here in Tokyo and I love ice cream. Let's see how convenience store ice cream fares compared to the, the Hokkaido soft serve we tried earlier. Damn, haagen crispy sandwich. Let's do it. Green tea azuki. Super nice, super crispy. The green tea. It's just the right amount of milky, but it's so yummy. Now we have the Family Mart Collection Hokkaido Milk Vanilla in a Waffle Cone. Mm, not bad. Super creamy. You can see the black vanilla seeds. Now this one is a Halloween special. It's Pumpkin Pudding Crispy haagen I don't understand this flavor. Not something I would buy again. Caramel Classic Crispy Sandwich. This is something I buy every single time I find myself in Asia outside of the Philippines. All the time. Kinda salty, not too sweet, super, super good. This may be the game changer. I love caramel, I love caramel ice cream. This is by a French dude that I super respect. Caramel versus caramel. This has some citrus. It's nice. Too sweet, but super good. This is mochi. Mochi is from Japan. Inside a shawl pao wrapper is ice cream. I think if you're in Japan, definitely mochi is a must. Moving into Waffle Town. Very solid. Mm. Oh my god, wait. There's chocolate. The Japanese ice cream gods do not lie to people. What you see is what you get. Again, from the haagen family of awesome. This is different from the others because it has a chocolate shell. This is tiramisu for sure. Super yummy. Last but not the least, everyone loves cute stuff. And I think this is why Erwan picked it out. I want to try a bite with the green and the red. It tastes like, I guess, your average ice candy. Winner of the bunch, I would say, is this mochi. And of course, my favorite, the haagen crispy sandwich. If you go with any other like sort of ice creamy flavors, you cannot go wrong. Mochi is a mainstay. You're in Japan, eat mochi. Mochi is from Japan. And for the grand finale, should I do this? At the end of the day, whether you like ice cream or not, Tokyo is just the kind of place where you want to eat everything. So just do that. Don't be afraid of being fat. You're on vacation. Have a happy holiday. I love you, Tokyo. Our flight home wasn't until 1 a.m., so we basically had to stay out in the city as long as possible. And even though we had already overeaten, as one does after walking around and jumping on trains all over the city, we were after a comforting meal. Happily enough, Japan seems to enjoy hot pots just as much as we do. Last meal of the trip, beautiful shabu shabu. This is a place that specializes in Kurobata Park. You have some that'll specialize in beef, you basically cook this slowly in a nice tempered bath. When it gets uh, almost fully cooked color, take it out, 
place that in your sauce with some scallions. I like to take mine with a little bit of miso on my chopsticks. It's clean, it's controlled, it's delicious. Fatty pork. Look at that. Fat is just holding my whole mouth. What better way to finish our trip off in Tokyo? Last meal, obviously some good sake. Good company for my friends over here. Ever since we started this series, it's been my dream to shoot in Tokyo. I've always been drawn to its rhythm, always on beat, but the more you listen to it, the more you realize that there is so much more hidden in its notes. Experiences that only happen in this moment and comparable to anything else you would have seen in the world. I could conjure up paragraphs and innumerable word combinations to drum up your excitement or paint you a picture. But at the end of the day, it will never be truly enough. You need to visit to grasp the concept of its soul. I realize that there's so much we didn't cover, but that's the beauty of it. You will always feel like you didn't do enough or that you probably missed out on some underground gatherings or great bites, never realizing that this is what Tokyo does to you. It leaves you with happy regrets, things to add to your bucket list, and a lingering question that you know will sound ridiculous if you voice it out. Could I one day live here? Could I bear the constant confusion and the daily learning curve? I guess we'll just have to come back to figure that one out. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about having a good time and doing exactly what you like. And I love making these videos to show you exactly where I like going and maybe help you organize your trip. We meet a lot of people who come up to us and say, hey, you know, I watched overnight and we tried some of your recommendations and we loved it and that makes me so happy. So thanks again for watching. This is Erwan Yusuf again for the Tokyo Metro City Guide. Please make sure to like, comment and subscribe below. We've shot two other episodes of Overnight. We have Overnight Fukuoka and Overnight Osaka. So please make sure to check those out as well. Peace out.